fourth quarter earning reports are wrapping up for most gold and silver miners with some spectacular numbers coming in. Yet it seems investors aren't responding yet. Over the past month, the GDX ETF, which tracks the major gold miners, is down close to 8%. Today, we're at 32.89. Joining me today is Peter Marone. He is the executive chairman for Yamana Gold. Yamana is a Canadian company that owns and operates gold, silver, and copper mines in Canada, Chile, Brazil, and Argentina. Peter, it's always good to see you. Welcome to StansberryInvestor.com. I'm happy to be here, and it's great to see you as well, Danielle. Thank you, Peter. Well, as I said at the start, uh, we're seeing um, some really big numbers uh, coming out from the miners. Uh, most financial and operational results have been uh, great, and we will be talking about Yamanas in, in a bit. But it seems um, investor sentiment is, uh, is not positive right now. Why do you think that's the case, Peter? Boy, what a tough question. I'd say the starting point, as always, and I try to make this distinction, Daniela, between investing in a gold equity and investing in gold. And But there's, there is this correlation, of course. Uh, my view is that if we look at the marketplace today, certainly our stock, uh, we're trading as if gold price is not $1,780 to $1,800, as if it's substantially below that, maybe as much as $150 below that. So I guess part of uh, in part, answer to the question is that investor sentiment on the sustainability of gold price at these levels is not there yet. Because if it were there, then I think that all, all of the equities would be trading at better levels. Someone had said to me years ago, decades ago, that often the gold price leads the equities or the equities leads the gold price. I think that we're in a case now where the equities are, are better forecasting a sentiment relating to gold price, a sentiment that perhaps it was not sustainable, at least in the short term at 1800, 1850, at higher levels, perhaps not even at the level that it's at now. And so waiting for an adjustment to occur before beginning to come back into the gold market, but more specifically the gold equities as well. But I do believe that that will come back. Well, right now, you know, gold has taken a break against uh, the backdrop of, uh, you know, rising yields. We have a, a stronger U.S. dollar, stronger U.S. economic data. Um, so, so, you know, how much is that uh, playing in, into effect here, Peter? Well, it, it's had a great run since it bottomed several years ago. And so let's look even from late 18, early 19 to where it's at today. It has had an, an, an exceptionally good run. It's a strategic asset. It's a portfolio diversifier. It del gold delivers returns. Uh, and while I would not be surprised, I'm not surprised by this correction. From late last year, Daniela, I've been saying that it seemed that gold was ahead of itself, that there was a likely um, a, some down leg before an up leg. But I will be stunned. I am stunned to believe that the economy does not overheat as a result of stimulus and as a result of pent up demand. You mentioned um, yields and interest rates. My impression is that there is a, a, a fear that uh, the, the monetary stimulus, particularly from the American Central Bank, will begin to taper back as inflation begins to take hold. We're certainly, we certainly seem to be seeing that in the bond market, or at least mm -hmm. that's the impression being given by the bond market. But I'd be stunned if we don't get a significant heating of the economy and overheating. Rely on history more than rely on economics, because there's an emotion to gold that does not always follow an economic model. But if you look at history, in periods where there's been pent-up demand, and we have had pent-up demand, Many of us have been at home for long periods of time, not going to restaurants, not buying things. When we start to travel again, use our cars more frequently, fuel, uh, the need for fuel, the, the need for, fuel, for food products. With a fiscal and monetary stimulus that we have seen and continue to see, look at what the Americans are considering doing with their fiscal stimulus package of $1.9 trillion with a T. So it seems to me that we're going to continue to get this stimulus Central banks will continue to have to manage the economy. There, has, there is weakness in the economy. It has to be um, uh, absorbed by these, these, this stimulus. And then there comes that pent up demand. And when that demand uh, is unleashed as a result of becoming freer to do things, it seems to me that we go into this inflationary cycle and that has historically been exceptional for gold price. That is an excellent point and really well said, Peter. And, and I believe in past interviews, you've said on the inflation point, um, because you're not operating in, in the U.S., you're not the mines won't really your operational costs uh, will not be affected because you're primarily, you know, in Chile, Brazil, Argentina, separate story. Correct. 
Uh, th that's right. And, and what we've been seeing is we've been seeing a, a modest level of inflation on our costs. What drives costs for mining companies uh, it isn't so much what's, what's happening in the broader economy and inflation in the, in the broader sense. What's, what would drive that is what's happening in our economies, in our industries. Uh, so where we saw the inflationary pressure in the last cycle, let's say up to 2012, 2013, was because everything in the extractive industries was overheated. Mm -hmm. We're not seeing that today. And so without that, I don't think that we see a cost escalation, a significant cost escalation in costs, while we will see a significant increase in gold price. It may take that leg down as it seems to be taking now. But I think ultimately, once this is unleashed, once the pandemic is behind us, that pent up demand is unleashed, with all that stimulus in the marketplace, it seems to me that we go into a, an inflationary event and that uncertainty on inflation and also the what where inflation ultimately goes has historically been very, very good for gold price. And that should be exceptional for gold equities. I know no uh, gold mining executive likes forecasting gold prices, and I'm not going to ask you to do that, Peter. But when you say you could see um, gold really pushing higher here, I guess in, you know, in what camp do you fall? We've had guests here with you know, forecasts of $20,000 gold, $10,000, $5,000. 2000 short term, uh, where do you fall? Well, I, I don't know that I'm good at predicting gold price, certainly in the short term. I made an error in 2007 when gold just touched above a thousand, as you might remember. Yes. Uh, I was asked where I thought it would go, and I said it would go to 1500, but I made the error of saying within a year. So it went to 1500 plus, a lot higher than 1500. It took a little bit longer than a year. But look, let's look at a few data points. First of all, I am, I used the word stunned before, I'm going to use it again. I'm stunned that significant bulge brackets, bulge bracket banks are predicting gold prices for $3,000 per ounce. We should all be stunned. Who would have thought that? A decade ago, we would have thought that that was Absolutely. probably on the fringe. And now here's where the mainstream is saying gold price will go. So I'm beginning yeah. to become far more comfortable that over the, the certainly the intermediate and longer term, some predictions of higher gold prices than $3,000 per ounce will materialize. Let's look at a further data point. Everyone talks about gold price at an all-time high, just above $2,000 an ounce. And I take the view that that's incorrect. Gold price in 1980 got to, I think it was just over $800 per ounce, about $820 per ounce. We were into an inflationary period, a geopolitical uncertainty. Uh, Afghans, Afghanistan was the cause of the day with the Russians having invaded Afghanistan, the Americans calling the Russians the evil empire. Those of us that were around back then remember all of those things. Let's take the present dollar value of that $820 per ounce. We come close to $2,700. And everything is a cycle. Cycles are forever. And so it seems to me that if we're looking at gold price at an all-time high, we should be looking at what happened in 1980 and adjusting that to present dollars and that comes to a number that is well in excess of where the, at least $1,000 in excess of where the gold price is today. Peter, I'd love to get your thoughts now on, you know, just going back to the point about the, the current energy levels in gold. Um, do, you know, we're seeing the excitement, of course, surrounding Bitcoin, over 50,000 as we're speaking, the energy that has been brought into the silver space, mostly uh, due to the silver squeeze uh, narrative, and copper also taking uh, some spotlight here at eight year highs. I know you also mine silver and copper. Um, do you feel that these other assets are also part of the reason that the spotlight has kind of shifted away from gold? Yeah, so it's, it's a, another really good question, uh, Daniela. And I'd say that today, it certainly seems as if Bitcoin has the pole position as the stimulus asset, the quote unquote stimulus asset. And why I smile a little bit is that I have this discussion, almost a debate with my older sons mm -hmm. who are active in the market and investing uh, uh, on a regular basis. And so it's the old, old economy versus the new economy. And I believe I've persuaded them. They persuaded me that Bitcoin should be, that cryptocurrency should be in a portfolio. And I believe I persuaded them that gold should be in a portfolio also. So Bitcoin has certainly outperformed. Um, it's performing in reaction to fiscal stimulus. It certainly seems to be doing that, but it's volatile. It's thinly traded. 
it's not easy to trans transact and it's tightly held. It's a comparatively small market. It is a fraction of the size of the gold market. And as I said before, gold has had a great run in the last few years. I think that there's another leg up, uh, perhaps after this correction that we're seeing we're seeing pre presently, but I certainly see, see that there's a, there's a leg up and there's room in a portfolio. If you have Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies in a portfolio, I think there's excellent room for gold to be in that uh, uh, portfolio also. So is it taking away from it? I, I don't know. I don't think so. My impression is that there are distinct markets. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the headline seems to be that Bitcoin is the flavor of the day. As I said, it's the, it seems to have the pole position as, a, as the mm -hmm. asset that's reacting to stimulus. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I think that uh, there are different investors. It's a different investor class. So I don't know that that's, that's entirely true. Silver is interesting. Silver is uh, a much thinner market than gold, but it has other uh, uses as well. The use of silver in, uh, in the solar panels, just as an example. So it's a green metal as much as it is a precious metal. And so it seems to me that silver is, is nicely poised to overperform gold. And going back to what I said before about cycles being forever, uh, we've hit per a period where the gold to silver ratio was well in excess of 100 to one. Mm -hmm. And historically that silver to gold to silver ratio is closer to let's say 60 to one, okay. it's gone as low as 40 to one. My impression is that silver will overperform gold. And I'm happy to say that we produce 10 million ounces of silver in, in our portfolio. I am very bullish on copper price. And as you mentioned, we have a very robust and significant, one of the larger development stage copper, gold and molybdenum assets in our portfolio, not yet in production, but with a production platform over 30 years per year of about 500 million pounds of copper per year. So it's a, it, it's a, it's a good portfolio that takes advantage of what I think is the bread and butter, which is gold price. And at one end of the spectrum is the more speculative, but a lot of torque with silver. And the other end of the, spec the spectrum is this uh, tried, tested and true, uh, it, sort of a supply and demand driven uh, a price that comes from comes from copper. Mm. Uh, Peter, just uh, just to get back to one more point on, on Bitcoin, and this may be a very bold bold question, and some might think I'm crazy to ask a gold uh, executive if he would ever consider um, placing some of the company's assets into Bitcoin, kind of taking a play from Michael Saylor and Elon Musk. Could that ever happen? Well, so. Um... Uh, I, I am chuckling a bit because of the four categories of assets that we've talked about, gold, silver, copper, and, uh, and cryptocurrencies, or Bit Bitcoin in particular, we've got three of the four. So I, I would prefer to leave it. <laughs> once you've covered the bases for three of the four, right. you don't need the fourth. Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, let's talk uh, the company's uh, Q4 results and plans uh, for the, the rest of the year. Some really great numbers uh, here, Peter. Yes, with the impact of COVID-19 last year, as you are aware, we had a couple of operations that for um, uh, some period of time were on care and maintenance. I'm very happy to say that all of our operations and all of the jurisdictions in which we operate have designated mining as a, an essential service. In one of our operations uh, in Argentina, Cerro Moro, uh, we had more of a ramp-up challenge. And that ramp-up challenge was because of a, of a rampant um, um, uh, infection uh, in the country. It led to interprovincial transfer, uh, 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 transportation restrictions. Uh, we employ 100% from country at that operation as we do at all operations, but uh, a large percentage, 30 to 35% comes from other provinces. And so with restrictions, with quarantining requirements, it did have an impact on that operation, but we produced 901,000 ounces between gold and silver on a gold equivalent basis last year, but the platform of the company is a million ounces. That's what the five mines produce. So this year then, with all of that behind us, we're back up to that million ounces. That represents about an 11% increase in production from last year. But last year with that 900,000, 901,000 ounces, we generated almost 700 million of uh, uh, cash flow. Uh, we left the year with $430 million in cash. Uh, we significantly improved the financial position of the company, not only in terms of cash, but in terms of the improvement to net debt. So as we enter into this year with all operations running and with that 11% increase in production, it should portend for an even better year by comparison to last year. 
And, and can you talk to us a little bit about the Odyssey Underground uh, project, Peter? This is a significant project that will extend mine life at Canadian Amal Arctic through 2039. Yeah, so I'd like to put a bit of context to the Canadian Amal Arctic and to Odyssey. We bought Canadian Amal Arctic in 2014. You might remember that there was a hostile takeover bid to buy the company that owned it, to buy Cisco Mining. Right. And we came in as the white knight, and then our partner came in in a second round of bidding. And now it's a 50-50 partnership. That's we won right. the bidding, and it's a 50-50 partnership. And we bought it because we thought what an exceptional open pit deposit that is here in front of us, where we can toggle and, and push on levers and buttons to improve the efficiency of the operation. We've gone from 40,000 tons per day to 56, 57,000 tons per day. That means about 650,000 ounces of production on a 100% basis per year. This year and next year, it's actually gonna be a little bit higher uh, than that. We knew in 2014 that there was an underground, but what we did not know is just how big that underground would be. And so we expected something of size there. But what we, we have today is more than 14 million ounces in three ore bodies below the area of the pit of Canadian Malartic. We call it the Odyssey Project. We've now completed studies and made a construction decision. We expect that it will cost us about 1.3 billion of capital over the course of six and a half years. But more importantly, because it's going to have two components. One is a ramp into the upper ore bodies that were already in development. We've already got permitted on that. And the other is a shaft uh, with a hoist for the, for the deeper sections of those ore bodies. It puts us in a great position because we're getting production early on. So rather than getting all that development for six years and not getting production until 2027, we start getting production in 2023. And this is what I think got missed. Because between 23 and 27, we get about 932,000 ounces of production from underground that does not impact the underground operation at all. 14 million ounces, 900,000 ounces is not much, not much at all. But that 932,000 ounces is during the development phase. And that means that that cash flow is funding a huge portion of the CapEx. Mm. At 1550 gold, it funds about 50% of the CapEx. So to say it differently, it's going to cost us somewhere in the range of $650 million for 100%, so 300 to $350 million for our 50% over six years, a very manageable CapEx. I think it's an excellent, it's a brilliant plan that uh, our guys and our partners guys and the operations, of course, have come up that, uh, that delivers on this project. The production platform then when it's fully running is an average of 545 thousand ounces per year, as you said, up until about five, uh, 2040. And I think that that gets extended. You really brought me back. I remember uh, covering that story when uh, Yamana came in and, and swooped up that deal. So uh, time definitely uh, flies. Before, uh, before I let you go, um, you know, you mentioned uh, COVID and obviously the impact it's had on our on, on the industry and you know this is supposed to be a time where we're supposed to be seeing each other at the bmo uh, conference at the pdac the world's largest mining conference in, in toronto um obviously these events not taking place uh, my my question is how has this affected uh m a activity in in the mining industry with ceos not being able to really meet face to face has it affected m a activity well what a, what a really good question and but a tough one to answer. Uh, my view is that um, business combinations, any form of business combination is sort of like any relationship. You have to nurture the relationship. It's not different from relationships in family, relationships in couples. Uh, you have to nurture the relationship. You have to get to know the parties. It's, it's, it's normal to look at it and say, what does it look like on paper when an investment bank puts something together that says, this is what a combination or an acquisition looks like. It's easy to look at it and say, this is what the numbers look like. But what, what has to be done on the diligence? But the best diligence that can be done and the best way to really create a high quality opportunity is really to get to know the parties that are involved with it. And that does require face-to-face um, -face discussions, one-on-one -on -one type discussions. So it, the answer to your question, I think, is yes. Without a direct engagement, without that one-on-one -on -one interaction, 
that occurs at these conferences, I think it does become more difficult. Well, I hope uh, hope things will uh, return to to whatever normal will be uh, soon. Uh, Peter, I appreciate you joining me here on StansberryInvestor.com. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for inviting me. Fantastic conversation with Peter Marone, Executive Chairman uh, over at Yamana Gold. Thank you so much for tuning in. We will have much more for you, so be sure to stay tuned to StansberryInvestor.com. You can follow us on all our social media platforms. Thank you for watching. I'm Daniela Cambone.